Okay. And why doesn't this one work? Let's try it once more. Somebody tell me why it doesn't work. It doesn't work here. I know why it doesn't work. I know why it doesn't work because we have to put the cursor. We have to put the cursor on this guy. And now it should work. Right? Yes. Yeah, thank you. The, the problem is the cursor was on the MS Teams. Uh, ah. OK, so now it works. OK, so if you take a look at this picture, you'll see that in green you have a lot of mathematicians. And uh, just to, to get things a little bit in perspective, you've got some musicians in purple and some uh, authors in, in uh, Orange. The reason for showing this picture is uh, the dates. You know, I went up to 1900 roughly, and I didn't trust myself going beyond that. I might offend somebody who's not on the on the uh, on the chart. But you can see uh, a, a large number of mathematicians. Uh, the names I think you you are familiar with many of them. And if we go, the reason I show this now is uh, those of you in fluid mechanics will recognize a lot of those equations. Now that we've got the, the, um, the Navier and Cauchy, and these are the equations that we use in, in fluid mechanics. The interesting thing on this slide are not the equations, because you've probably seen these before, it's the dates. So if you take a look, the, 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 the latest we have on there, so 1800, and that's, that's a long time ago. And basically, a long time ago, our governing equations for fluid mechanics were finished. I mean, we, we had the governing equations. And just to remind you, the governing equations typically that we are using are conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and conservation of energy. And uh, so I've just, I don't know exactly whether you use symbolic notation or differential, it doesn't matter, but these are the equations we use. And you can also have conservation of entropy, but I've just left that out for now. Okay, so basically you could say 1800 something or another, the, the problem was solved. We're finished. <laughs> okay, uh, but everybody knows that we're not finished, and a lot comes after that, and that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about today. And I'd like to start with this diagram here. And this is again uh, a little bit. You can see I've put I put some dates on here. You know, up to 2000. I, I stopped uh, around 2010 and 12. And, and what I've done is I've shown you so developments in this graph. I ex I'm all in the exp uh, uh, you know, in the experimental area and one in a, a model equations and numerical methods. And all of these have undergone tremendous. Uh, development within my lifetime. I mean, okay, you're a little younger, but, but within my lifetime, amazing things have changed. And a lot of them are technologically uh, driven. Let's say the experimental techniques, I think everybody knows the laser. I think when was the first laser? 1964 or something, and we've got an expert at 60 even. I, I always see here 64. Anyways, so the laser, you have polarized coherent light, and suddenly you can do interferometry everywhere. And, and so all kinds of new uh, uh, techniques were developed um, uh, from technological advances. Okay, and this is what, and of course, integrated circuits, you, you don't even remember when they were first uh, introduced, or fast cameras, CCD or CMOS cameras, or PCs. I, I remember PCs first came out in 1985. I mean, this is, a lot has happened since then. Okay, so you can see, um, what I've done in green is these are a lot of techniques that some of them were there before and are just got easier to use or were more more capable of uh, measuring what you wanted and some are new and uh, some of these uh, some of these uh, things you you've heard before and some I'll show you today but equally oh, you can't read that too well potential flow and boundary layers that was sort of the first model equations back in Pantelstein and Kirtingham and then we have Rand's, uh, Reynolds average now here, Stokes equations. I'll actually show one of those later. And, and a large eddy simulation directly. So that's on the modeling side. So this is clearly so mathematics involved. We have to choose uh, suitable models, which will uh, mimic our physics as well as we want. And then we have the numerical methods. And I've just put here things like panel methods. That's, I don't know, is there anybody here from aerospace? Hands up. Nobody? Okay. So you know panel methods. I mean, this is. 
straightforward uh, work. But then, but then you have the finite volume or finite element methods and things like that. Okay, and all of this, I've tried to put sort of realistic dates when these came. I mean, you're obviously all younger, and all of this is uh, was there when you entered your, your studies. But this is all rather new, and, it, and a lot of it is still developing, I think is the message. This is an interesting diagram. So let's say I'm going to talk mostly about experimental work. I'm an experimentalist. I, okay, we have numerical work also, but mostly experimental. This is an interesting uh, diagram. You know, these are dimensions, these are components, you know, and and so, and of course in dimensions we also have time. If something's time resolved, then you have the fourth dimension. And and the components I've put not just, you know, velocity field components, UVW, but also things like if you're measuring in a spray, the drop size or the drop refractive index, which is the temperature or something like that. So you have, this could be, this could be a, a little bit larger, but you can see also, that uh, we have now different techniques which can go and look to the far left, <laughs> three components on, and three or four, uh, uh, sorry, uh, three or four dimensions, three or four components. I, now we're in a position to capture an entire velocity field and this suddenly opens up a lot of new challenges. Okay, and this is a little bit what I'll talk about. So I just tried to put together a few things. I mean, where is mathematics and it's everywhere? Uh, but, I mean, obviously it's there where you're looking for analytical solutions uh, to your problem. And I've just said things like Prandtl's boundary layer or conformal uh, mapping uh, transformations. Most, I see a few heads nodding. I know most of you have heard of these things if you haven't used them yourself. Okay, and uh, then we have computational fluid mechanics. These are these RANs and LES and DNS and all this stuff. And then we have, and that's a little bit more my focus today, is when we're doing um, measurements, okay, things like data assimilation or image processing, and can we uh, achieve more out of our measurements uh, with some mathematics behind it? And uh, and then, of course, optimization for minimizing cost functions and whatnot. Okay, I won't talk too much about that, and I, in fact, I don't know too much about that. So. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is the contents of my lecture. Uh, I've, I've divided it into three groups, drop in, drop volume. These are just exemplary. These are just simply examples and by no means comprehensive, and I could probably choose another 10 examples to show you uh, the same thing. But it's just okay, just to give you an idea and to promote your, your enthusiasm and, and a little bit of curiosity. So whole field velocity measurements and heat transfer and spray cooling. And each of them have their own sort of um, slot in, in my overall uh, picture here. So I start with this drop in drop volume, and as you know, you usually have a thank you slide either at the end or at the beginning, <laughs> and I put it at the beginning. So you have to thank the people who gave you money, so that's on there, and you have to thank the people who did the work, and normally the professors don't do the work. So, <laughs> so in this case, uh, uh, this, uh, he's, he, he will get his PhD maybe in January or something. Else. Okay. Oh, this is a red droplet hitting a, a transparent film, and we see a crown developing, and then we see some greater Taylor instabilities, and then we see little droplets coming out, and those droplets are really plateau or plateau really if you're French, also plateau really instabilities. And notice that some of the droplets have red in them, and the question is, uh, how much volume of the red is in each of the droplets, if any at all? And uh, why is that question interesting? Imagine you are in the internal combustion engine uh, field, which I hope you're not because it doesn't have a big future. But in any case, um, uh, you're, you're shooting uh, fuel droplets into the, with a, maybe a, a common rail injector or something, and you're injecting these fuel droplets into the cylinder and they hit the cylinder wall, which is now oil, and these little secondary droplets come out and if they come out in, a, in the combustion process, that's what we call knocking. That's when your engine knocks and you try to avoid that. You don't want that stuff in, in your engine. Or even more uh, interesting, if you have an SCR, so a selective catalytic reduction, which is now low emission or zero emission uh, diesel, then uh, you're, you're, um, uh, you know, you're injecting urea into uh, urea water solution into your chamber. And the same thing happens on the walls. So you're interested in this kind of thing. The question is, how do we find, now comes the, uh, the um, uh, measuring techniques. How do we find the volume of the red in each of those droplets? 
Okay, this is challenging. So uh, obviously it's going to be in the direction of image processing. And we can look at a droplet, you know, we can in an acoustic levitator, so we levitate a droplet, and we could take a syringe and put a droplet, a red droplet, and then we can take a syringe and put some clear droplet around it, and then we get a drop. We know exactly ground truth. We know the volume of the red in the in the droplet. And then we can look at it with a camera, and you see, depending on how it turns, and you know, then you see different images. And you say, okay, okay, how do we get from these images uh, the volume, so that's the same droplet, six images of the same droplet, and now we want to try how much is in each one. Okay, this is a, everybody immediately sees the problem. Okay, but on the other hand, if we go back to ray tracing, then we know uh, uh, if we're looking from here, all the parallel rays coming from our droplet, they have to come from inside, and we can do some simply Snell's law and refraction, and we can see, okay, where is the light from the red droplet coming to our camera? And then we can see, for instance, if the droplet that what is in the back side, our camera's over here, see? So if it's in the back side, if this little droplet looks like the entire droplet, it fills the entire droplet. If it's in the middle, it doesn't fill, and if it's in the front, the image we get of the red droplet is about the correct size. But obviously then, depending on the volume fraction, and depending on where the thing is, the area ratio is completely different, whether it's on the back side, the center, or in the, on the front side. This is fairly simple ray tracing optics. I think we have an expert here who works on <laughs> probably bottom mold fibers, panda fibers or something. Anyway, so, uh, so this is fairly clear. And obviously, you've got too many equations and too many, or too many unknowns for the equation you have. So the next thing you do, of course, is you, you go and you look at the droplet from two sides. And if you're a little bit clever with mirrors and a prism, you can do it with one camera. So now you see a droplet hitting the film, but the film is actually, you're, you're seeing two sides at once, 90 degrees to one another. And if you look at maybe two droplets at the same height, that's the same droplet. You know, or those, that's the same droplet. But you have to look at the ones at the same height. And now you have two orthogonal views of the same droplet, and they might even be rotating a little in time. So now you can say, hmm, now maybe I can make a better estimate of how much red is in the, no, that's an interesting question. Okay, and then of course, uh, you can, if you follow their trajectory, you also know their, their velocity, you know, in time. So you know where the droplet is going. Okay, and now this, now comes the mathematics. Now we go to machine learning. And we use now a support vector machine, which basically says, okay, uh, we can quant, you know, we can take an image, or we, now we have two images, and we can take some features from the image. One feature would be the area ratio. That's obvious. You know, what's red and what's the, the total. And one feature could be, for instance, uh, where it is, the eccentricity of the of the red within the round droplet. Or one feature, I've put a few others here, is the aspect ratio. So we use up to seven features. And then you start in the machine learning, and you say, okay, hmm, I have to teach my machine. But this is really easy because we can simulate it all. I mean, ray tracing. We can, we can take, we can take um, you know, a, a, a droplet. We know the volume fraction of the red inside. And then we can go and say, what would it look like from here, from here, from here? What would it look like if the red was in the back or the front or the side? We could do millions of these things and compute it all and train our machine. And then, of course, we could say, OK, we also compute for each thing the eccentricity and the aspect ratio and all these things. And then we could say, OK, we, now we have hyperplane. So I've just shown one hyperplane. So you know, you have. So you have feature one and feature two. And you could say, okay, if it's on that side of, of this line with some uncertainty, then we'll call it this. And if it's on the other side, we'll call it this. Now you have to project that into seven dimensions, seven hyperplanes, and say, okay, what is the probability if you, if you have these two pictures that you get the right answer? Right? That's machine learning or in some form, one form of it. Um, and so you can do that, and you can download these uh, uh, support vector machines from the, I'm, probably half of you already used this, I don't know. Anyways, then you can go and say, how good was I? And this is here, you know, we just did a lot of different droplets. This is just some identification thing. And, you know, these are the droplets and, uh, and the volume fraction that each droplet was. We put it in the levitator again, you know, so we could test our thing. 
And in each of these points, we did a lot of droplets, so there's some variance with the repeatability. And, and then we said, okay, what did our vector machine, if we had two images, what did it do? It was a little bit off, wasn't exact. Here it was very good, here it was a little bit off, here it's not bad, here it's not bad, and up here it doesn't look good. And then we said, ah, maybe the thing is being deformed. And we assumed that all the droplets were spherical. But in the acoustic levitator, because of gravity, you get a little deformation. So then we did something else. Instead of putting a red droplet in, we put a red sphere, and we put the droplet around it. So the inside didn't deform. <laughs> and that's, that's the ones here with the particle. And you can see those are pretty good. So obviously, you, we didn't take into account deformation. But if you did that, you could be better. OK, so this is an example where I didn't know anything about uh, support vector machines when we started. <laughs> Typical engineer. Okay, and, uh, and, and then we learned about this, and it seems now we have a very reliable way of making our measurements. And this is actually a good, uh, it's, I'm finished with that. That's my summary. You can read it. Uh, it's the usual things. I mean, it just says, oh, yeah, you have to have a wide view of what's going on and, and, and exploit what's out there. And of course, we'll continue that. So now I move to the next uh, topic whole field velocity measurement. So this is now really fluid mechanics pur pure. And uh, the, I will start with the tomo PIV and then the magnetic resonance velocimetry. And the tomo PIV, the tomo is tomographic, now tomo PIV. And, and, and this is that left side again that I said, you know, three components and three dimensions and you just get everything. And, and let me show you. Uh, you. Basically what you do is you take a laser light, you uh, uh, expand it a little bit and you illuminate an entire volume. And uh, the bigger the volume, the less the intensity, so it's a little bit of a trade off. But you in illuminate the entire volume and then you look at it with three or four cameras. And you can imagine if you look at it with three or four cameras, you can know exactly where everything is with some, uh, um, we call them marked uh, algorithms. So you can choose, you can find out for every particle. Well, there are particles in the flow. You have to put particles in the flow. And then you know where all these things are. Okay, so uh, this is the setup. You, you basically take, with these four cameras, two pictures, one after the other. And where the, where the particles move, then you get their velocity. Three components, three dimensions. And that's called particle image velocimetry for those who have not used it before, PIV. And, um, and then if you, if you have a fast laser, so you do a double pulse, no? and you get two, two instants in time. You have fast cameras, and these two instants in time are coming, let's say, at 10 kilohertz. Then you can be time resolved. I mean, you can just, so I, should, I could show a film from Fulvio, Scarano, maybe. But you, this whole thing can then be time resolved. So now we're sitting there, and this is not long. We're talking about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, now suddenly we know the velocity field everywhere at, at every time. Okay, this is a tremendous move, uh, advancement in things. So uh, this is one of our own experiments. We did at the ETH Zurich. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. You were making one thing. No, it's not a, a light sheet. I've made it into a volume. I, I, yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Normally you think they're only a light sheet. No, no, this is an entire volume. Yeah, well, you try, well, that's what we're doing here. This one is also four cameras, but it's one camera and four meters. And, and so you can, you, you can track everywhere where the particle is. You have, of course, you can't, your depth of field has to be very long. So everything is in focus, very small aperture. And then you have a high depth of field. But the, but the small aperture means you get less light, so you have to have a more powerful laser. And OK, it's all a trade-off. OK, but yeah, we can talk about that. Okay, anyways, in this case, uh, this was a, a box of turbulence uh, with rotation. So turbulence behaves differently with rotation. Uh, you don't have to know that, but that was our experiment. And, and then instead of four cameras, we had one camera, four mirrors, and a prism that brought it all into one. So the, the camera has a chip, and there are four segments on the chip, and each segment had a different view. Okay, four, basically four views. And so now we have, uh, and then you can track each particle, and those, those lines are the particle in time. And then, of course, you're sitting there, that's a Lagrangian field. Uh, that's a Lagrangian field, and what I showed you before was an Eulerian field. And now we're sitting there, what can we do with this as fluid mechanicists? And, um, 
1938 in Göttingen, working with Prantl, Schwabe, Schwabe uh, recognized, actually, and if, if you translate it, it is on the instigation of Professor Prantl, he said, well, if I know the entire velocity field, I can compute the pressure field, governing equations. And now comes the really interesting thing. If you know the pressure field, you know the force field. So think about, you know, I'll show you later some flapping wings, and you want to know the force on the wing with time. OK, now it becomes really interesting. So let's look at it. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, so this was this is already a long time ago. But a long time ago, you didn't have three components in three dimensions. You had, at most, some flow visualization in a plane. You didn't know. And if it was it, if it was a plane or situation, you could, from such pictures, if you could estimate the velocity, you could estimate the, the pressure. Okay, but let's uh, carry on. So now, suddenly, so now I'm talking to the aerodynamics. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, suddenly now you're interested in looking at um, flows in which you have unsteadiness. So think of that little bird flying down. So I don't know if somebody is in biomimetics or in uh, sort of bio-inspired fluid mechanics, but you know, you're, you're interested in bird flying and, and perching and, and all these kind of things. Or, uh, and you can go of course into, uh, into wind tunnels, but basically now uh, you can measure pressure everywhere if you knew the flow field everywhere dependent on time. And uh, so it's non-intrusive, you don't have anything in the flow. Uh, you could um, estimate instantaneous forces on a, on a moving body. Uh, you can, uh, okay, also that's unsteady aerodynamics. And of course you can then start doing this in your wind tunnel. So this is a Canada goose. <laughs> this is a model Canada goose and uh, we put that in the wind tunnel. Or um, you can, this is, a, this is a dragonfly, you know, with the two wings, and it's a model two-dimensional dragonfly. And you start thinking, ah, maybe the interaction from one wing, the vortex shedding, is, a, is favorably influencing the second wing. Maybe dragonflies are really smart, we don't know. Okay, and this is a way to start looking at them. And so now we have to go back. Now we need the mathematics, it's very clear. And so we can start and say, Remember the, the um, momentum equation, the Navier-Stokes equations. And you can see that that's the Navier-Stokes equations. And then we can say, well, supposing it's a Newtonian fluid, and it's, uh, it's um, we, uh, let's say, like always in aerodynamics, we neglect the body forces. So these body forces are gone. And uh, we've been able to, uh, um, this is Newtonian, so that all uh, reduces actually disappears into the pressure, and these are the viscous forces, so the Laplacian. And, and then we get this idea, okay, the pressure gradient now, take a look at the right-hand side, it's just velocity field, and we know all of that everywhere. So, but we, it's only the gradient of, of pressure. So if you know the pressure somewhere, you can march from that point everywhere in the flow field and get the pressure, but you have to measure it somewhere, yeah? maybe on the wall, somewhere convenient. And then you know the pressure everywhere. So now we have the entire pressure field and the entire velocity field in the flow. And this is, I mean, people dreamed of this for 100 years before this came about. Okay, so then you can say, well, uh, it could be even easier if, if, you know, it's an incompressible, so if it's divergence free, if it's a steady flow, then we get it alone from the Poisson equation. It's rather simple. Okay, so now we can look at the momentum equation in integral form. So, you know, the momentum equation is mass times acceleration is equal to all of the acting forces. So let's do it the other way around. Let's put the forces over here, and that's equal to mass times du dt, but du dt is the number of equations. And so uh, we have then in this form, this is the fluid acceleration, and these, and, uh, these are now fluxes, and notice they're all surface integrals. This is the viscous stress, except for this volume integral. Okay. So now we can think, ah, I want to find the force, let's say, on a moving wing. And I have to do this volume integral, of course, around the wing. And then I have to do a control volume, which includes that, and all the fluxes around the control volume, but I can measure that. Okay, so, but we can use the Leibniz theorem, you know, to put, uh, put this outside the integral, at least in fluid mechanics, that's fine. And um, 
So, so I mean, it's clear for steady flows, let's say if there's no change in, in uh, um, time, for steady flows, then basically uh, all we have to do is have a control body. Think of it. You have to imagine practically what's happening. You're in the wind tunnel. You've got this model in your wind tunnel, and you want to find the force on the model. You don't. You could buy an expensive six-component balance, <laughs> or you could buy a very expensive Tomo PIE, and you have the velocity field. And then, without measuring the force acting on that thing, you measure the velocity field, and then you and the fluxes on top of the wind tunnel are zero. The fluxes on the bottom are zero. You measure the fluxes here and the fluxes there, and you've got your integral. Okay, if it's time dependent, suddenly, hmm, then you have to know. You have to know the du dt everywhere in the volume. Then, then that's a good reason why we would then take Gauss's theorem, change the volume integral into a surface integral, and then you would get something like this. Then you see it's all surface integrals. I mean, it's still not trivial because now you need um, you need very exact measurements everywhere in the flow and, and close to boundaries and stuff. But this is done now. I mean, we can, it, it's possible to do. And you, you can see without the mathematical background, it's, it's, it's just not. Okay, and, and basically the, the technology is driving all of this. You know, you get faster cameras, or better resolution cameras, or better lasers. Okay, so there's still some open, uh, open issues uh, and, and things to work on, and compressible flows makes it more difficult. But that's, now I'm going to, I have to watch the time. I think we'll make it. Okay, so um, now I'm going to move the magnet, magnetic resonance to, uh, to uh, 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 velocimetry, which is probably not so, but I can tell you you're getting a new medical center here, you know, behind the supermarket, and they will have, no question, uh, probably a seven Tesla um, MRI, and then the engineers should start knocking on their door and say, we also want to use this. <laughs> okay, I can, only, I can only encourage you to do that. <laughs> Okay, we had to go a little bit away to fiber the south of where we are to do this. But let's take a look. Uh, I mean, so again, my thank you slide. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, uh, these uh, three, um, so these two were my doctoral students, and that's a mathematician, a uh, doctoral student who I worked with in the mathematics department. And um, so I think everybody knows MRI. Maybe you've even been one in yourself for some broken bone, or I have one on the knee or something. And uh, so you basically take the intensity, uh, you know, and, and you can see bone uh, material. But what I'm going to talk about is MRV, like net resonance velocimetry. Obviously, we're going to measure velocity fields. And um, so this is now a living heart, and it's phase average. So it's not time resolved, but it's just, you know, you measure the same phase of the heartbeat many times and average it, and then you move a little bit in phase and do it again, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and it's not taking into account uh, the um, the wall movement of the heart. So it's a little bit, it's sort of first step. But if, nevertheless, it's a moving, it's a living heart, uh, but, and this is the velocity field. So let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, clearly we're getting three dimensions, three components. That's clear from the picture. Uh, we, we need no optical access. We don't need windows or anything. Uh, it's not evasive. There's almost no post-processing. We get all of those data out within about 20 minutes after the measurement. And um, but of course, uh, um, it, 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 there can be no metal involved. You know, you can't make a a flow rig at home or in your workshop and put it in. It doesn't work. <laughs> okay. So the work we were doing was actually engineering work, but I'm I'm going to describe a little bit from the uh, from the viewpoint of the medical now, I mean, because we did this also, and, and I don't know, you probably haven't had yet a, a stroke or a heart attack, but I mean, everybody knows what sort of uh, aneurysms and stenosis, and this is one of the big killers of cardio, uh, cardiovascular diseases. And um, I actually did have one. I had a spontaneous dissection in the carotid artery here. And uh, basically what happens is it's a, a, a narrowing of the artery. It heals itself if you get it soon enough and take some blood thinning and everything is okay now, obviously. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be some permanent damage. <laughs> okay, anyways, um, so I was also interested in this kind of work. And, 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 and one of the reasons for this type of thing, either aneurysm or stenosis, is the wall shear stress. It's fluid mechanics. 
which the medical doctors don't know too much about, by the way. And so uh, the wall shear stress is basically the, the, um, uh, the velocity gradient on the wall times now the dynamic viscosity. So I put the, uh, you know, it's wall shear stress is dynamic viscosity, du dy, I mean u is in this direction, y is in this direction, at the wall. So, and there's several reasons why that's important, but one is that this mechanical stress, shear stress on the wall um, promotes uh, cell division and cell. The other thing that promotes cell division is if you have high blood pressure and the artery or the vein is expanding too much, and then you get uh, extensional um, strain. This also promotes cell division, and cell division is not good. <laughs> then you get mm, aneurysms and things like that. But um, the question is, what is it? And where, when is it important? And what is the wall shear stress in different situations? And, and people have been trying to measure this for a long time. Okay, so let's um, continue and say, can we measure wall shear stress, let's say, in the uh, water or in some different parts? And okay, so, um, I mean, this is actually interesting because now you can measure fluid velocity in vivo, not in vitro. So in the living, not outside the lab. And uh, this is just a reminder. So, but now, of course, if, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, more or less, it depends on many, I mean, there's a lot of literature on this, but it's more or less Newtonian. And there are platelets in there, but um, actually uh, most of it is Newtonian. And, and you can usually assume it's not completely, but for most cases it is. There are situations where it doesn't look good, but yeah. And, and there's a lot of literature on that, by the way. Some of it's controversial, but it's pretty clear now. Um, okay, so um, now the problem is du dy at the wall. <laughs> Where's the wall? <laughs> and I mean, a little bit uh, making a mistake makes a huge difference. No? It's a differential and, and a small, small uh, mistake in y. <laughs> I think everybody understands that immediately. And now take a look. I mean, here's the wall. <laughs> You've got a problem. And because the resolution, we're talking typically um, about uh, half a millimeter. That depends on the Tesla. Typical Tesla, uh, typical MRI machines are something like three Tesla. Now we're working with seven Tesla. For monkeys and things, or for elbows, you get machines that can go up to 12, 14 Tesla. But the resolution depends heavily on the on the magnetic strength, and um, and I don't know what you're getting here in uh, what you'll get here at ISC. I have no idea. Anyways, uh, where is the position of the wall? That influences the gradient, and that influences our estimate of the wall shear stress to make the uh, story complete. And and the completely high bias there is you know. So you try to you try to um, uh, you try to. Uh, um, uh, optimize your estimation of the wall shear stress. You do that by inputting into the problem a priori data. This is what we're talking about. And the mathematicians talk, when they say that, they talk about regularization. And they say, okay, uh, I have some data, but I know that that data must, the velocity field, huh? that data must uh, comply with the magnetic slope equations, which is my best model of fluid mechanics. And if I know that, can I make a better estimate of the wall shear stress instead of just doing A to the times B U D Y? Because I know the navier stokes equations must, must, uh, must be uh, um, uh, followed. And that's that equation. So this is the Navier-Stokes equations. You might know, recognize it in symbolic notation. And this F, so you've got, this is the measured velocity field. This is the true velocity field. And there's going to, you're trying to minimize that, given such that this is uh, fulfilled, and in this case, divergence-free. It's a divergence-free, uh, so incompressible flow. And and you're minimizing that, and, and you're giving some sort of a regularization or weighting to the Navier-Stokes equations with an alpha. And they say, how much do I want to weight my measurements, and how much do I want to weight my a priori knowledge? 
And believe me, I didn't know anything about regularization when we started this problem. Again, I can only encourage you to, to talk to not conclusions about something like this. And the question is, can you improve your estimates? And the, the answer is yes, you can improve them tremendously. OK, so um, I, I will be a little bit faster on this because I assume that a lot of people are a little bit curious to know how MRV works. <laughs> And, and uh, I can give you sort of an MRV 101 course in 10 minutes, and I'll do that. And so um, let's, let me say, basically, we're working with the protons. And you need a proton, basically, that has a mechanical spin, which is not zero. And hydrogen is like that. And we, most of our body is water. And in, in, in water is a hydrogen proton or a couple. OK. And um, these protons, basically, if you put them into a magnetic field, so B, and you turn on the magnetic field, they all stand up and, and go in one direction. OK, so they're sitting there, and they're actually rotating. And they're rotating what, with what we call the Lamar frequency. And the rotation frequency is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. Uh, sorry, the uh, yeah, strength of the movement. And, and so you have this constant uh, ratio. And, and now what we do is we sit there. So you've got this huge magnetic field, and everything is aligned. And then you go with a radio frequency, and you, and you perturb it. You hit it with a signal. And what happens to this thing? Ah, oh, it starts gyrating. It, it goes out of sync. And it starts to gyrate now. And it gyrates, you see. And, and of course, it will eventually re relax. And how fast it relaxes depends on a few different things, among other things, the, the um, magnetic field. OK, so, so basically, uh, when you now go with detectors on this thing, every pixel has frequency information and phase information. And you can, you can then go into what we call k-space, so it's basically Fourier transform. And you can, you can find phase and frequency of each pixel, and, and you know, and if you have a lot of detectors, you know where it's coming from. And I think you know these MRIs, the, the things rotate around, and you, you hit it, and then they rotate, and they get from all the angles, and it's just tomography, it's tomography. Okay, so, and then you can look at the magnitude, and you can look at the phase. So now comes the trick. Why, where do we get the velocity, the, the velocity of these protons, which would then be the fluid velocity? Yeah? OK, so basically what we do is now, instead of just putting a magnetic field on, we put a magnetic field gradient. So let's just start with one gradient in one direction. So we put this gradient on, and then we can imagine the following. You know, so uh, we put this gradient we start with we start with a, a gradient in the positive direction. Here we've given the radial frequency pulse, and this thing's gyrating. And you know, if we had the proton which is stationary, it just stays there and boom, gyrates and eventually relaxes. But um, if a proton is moving, so there's some flow velocity, uh, suddenly it finds itself in a different uh, B field. There's a gradient there, and uh, if we go. Now, and we turn off the gradient and we turn it in the other direction, not down below. Now we've reversed the gradient. And now we watch it for a little bit longer. The fellow who was the proton who was stationary, his phase comes back to where it was. Everything's symmetric. But the other guy who's uh, running you know, up to a different frequency, his phase is now different. And so the phase gives us the velocity. We knew the time between the pulses. We know the phase difference, so we know how far that guy, the proton, uh, was moving in the gradient field. And now it's a very simple thing. Instead of putting one gradient in one direction, you put three gradients in three directions. And then you get all three components of the velocity in time. OK, and this is the basics. And this is being developed by physicists already, I don't know how long ago. but. Some of the very first ones were, happened to be in Germany, and then they. And that's why Siemens, Siemens were Toshiba, Siemens, and, and General Electric are the three main. Uh, but Siemens then built a huge, uh, a huge research center where we used to live near Nuremberg, uh, airline, and and they started building these things. I mean, and uh, I think maybe the world leader. I don't know. Anyways, um, now comes the engineering. I told you you can't put metal in these things, but you want to have your flow, <laughs> so you have to buy a laser bed fusion uh, additive manufacturing machine. So you, you, you know, rapid prototyping, polyamine. 
non-metal. And then you can just build your test section out of poly and lead. You have to make sure it's all sealed and there's all the screws have to be plastic, <laughs> no metal. And then you and and you just so you buy build you buy one of these machines and then you build test sections, whatever you want. And the patient now in the MRI is your test section. Oh, you push them in and, and, and then you have to have outside of the room because it's all magnetic, you have to have then a flow supply system and keep the temperature and the volume flow rate and the Reynolds number and all this stuff constant. So it, it becomes a little bit, uh, but I mean, these things you could build your test section in two days. I mean, you program it, NX6, put it into your machine, and two days later you've got your test section. And so, you know, you've got a, a control room with your supply, you've got your patient up here, you've got uh, hoses going in so that your flow goes in and out, and uh, okay, you just have to build it up, which I'm trying to encourage you to do. <laughs> in this medical facility. And then, you, okay, you get this data and then you have to decompose it in case space into, uh, into magnitude and phase and then you get your velocities. Okay, so I'm going to skip that just uh, as a matter of time. But now you go and say, okay, well, um, let's look now. How would we go about testing how good the wall shear stress measurement is in arteries? And the one way to do it is to do it on a model where you know the ground truth. And we, we can know the ground truth outside of the laboratory two ways, either outside of the MRI, two ways, either really high fidelity CFD, computational fluid mechanics, or we can use uh, other techniques like the laser Doppler velocimeter or something, which where we can measure very accurately the wall shear stress. And so, for instance, we were doing it, let's say, uh, or, or the third possibility for ground truth is you have an analytic solution. And we do have an analytic solution for um, uh, oscillating pipe flow. Yeah? Uh, you, you can look it up. So we started with oscillating pipe flow. And we have the analytic solution. We can make sure our laser Doppler works. And then we, we can do the CFD and all our degrees. And then we can go and look at the MRI and see how good are we now. And believe me, we're much, much better than the medical people manage to do. And um, so uh, and this would be typical. Now, this is an aneurysm. This is now moving to an aneurysm. Uh, so, uh, an artificial aneurysm, okay, but, but actually we have data on aneurysms. This is a, 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 good, a good mimic of a typical aneurysm. And so this is now, take a look, this is a typical pulse. It's not, well, it's not too typical, but a typical heartbeat pulse. The heartbeat's a little more asymmetric. And uh, these are at different phases, you know, the flow now starts to detach in the aneurysm. <coughs> then a formation of a strong vortex ring starts. And then uh, you get uh, this vortex impinges on the back wall. And then, uh, so these are measurements, also from, uh, from this polyamide uh, aneurysm. And, um, and then the vortex decays and goes again. And, and um, okay, so um, here's, yeah, and now the question is what is the wall shear stress everywhere? Because obviously the aneurysm is a self amplifying deviation. It gets bigger with time, and you either die or you find it in time and do something about it, and and uh, or you go and, and you actually mechanically uh, remove it, which is a delicate operation. And so this is now just I, I tried to show you that it's three dimensional, and this is now go ahead, yes. So the amulet is to keep the for the light body that can be moved. The aneurysm, no, no, the aneurysm does not move, or did I misunderstand? So Typically, the aneurysm is actually one sided, it's only on one side of the artery, and I've shown a symmetric one. That, okay. Yeah, it stays constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're thinking, uh, you know, if something dislodges and starts going, yeah, yeah, then you've got a problem. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what I was showing um, was this picture, and I actually wanted to take a look. It's three-dimensional, three-component, time-resolved, spatial resolution is about a half a millimeter. The temporal resolution is, we have 36 time steps. There's 1.1 billion vectors, and the measurement time was three and a half hours. So I challenged these guys in mechanical engineering to get 1.1 billion vectors in three and a half hours. Okay, so this is impressive, there's no question. And um, then we can look at the vorticity, and of course the vorticity on the wall is basically the wall shear stress, no? du, dy. And, um, 
and this gives us then the measured vorticity. And this now is we're getting close to home where we wanted to be. And uh, this is now uh, this is now the wall shear stress at different phases of the heartbeat. The wall shear stress, and we're looking at the MRV, the LDV, which we said was going to be very accurate, and the CFD, which should also be accurate. So the deviation between, let's say, the black line and the red line, you can see there are still some deviations. It's the MRV is not perfect. But on the other hand, who else can go into a living? And, and do this meta, I mean, it's still, it's better than nothing. I mean, you're getting a pretty good estimate. And, and we're all really only at the beginning. So these are different phases and, and you can look at them. And, um, and now I'm going to skip the CFT just because of time. Uh, and, and, but we can do CFT also. And, and basically, you know, this is CFT and that's MRV. And okay, they look similar. I would like to talk about data assimilation. This is again the idea that, you know, we know that the flow must behave according to the Navier-Stokes equations. And now we've got a rather difficult flow, and we should be able to improve our estimate now from that from the measurements I just showed you. We should be able to improve all of those by putting that a priori information into our measurements. So now we're really talking about, you know, data assimilation is to use measured observations in combination with a dynamical system model in order to derive accurate estimates of current and future states of the system. So you're predicting, it was came from weather analysis, of course, you want to predict the weather. And uh, so, you know, numerical weather forecasting, so you know, the forecast. And, and, and this is, of course, what we try to do. And this is, again, an example. We not only have to predict the velocity field, but also where was the wall. So this is actually the artery, the aorta of Mr. Teschner, that mathematician PhD student. I he went, he got his own artery, and he said, "Okay, if I'm going to do one in my in my PhD thesis, I'm going to do my own." And so this was uh, this is his, uh, and then you can see now that the um, uh, the wall is moving, and now he has to make an estimate of the wall where it is, and then he has to make with his, oh, it's not an easy thing. And this is the velocity field estimate, and I think you recognize again the Navier-Stokes equations, the incompressible flow, and the regularization, and he's now using not only for the velocity field, but now he's also, you see that's the, or well, maybe it's the round, he's also using, now I also have to regularize the wall. Where was the wall? So he's got two regularization factors in there now. Okay. This is clearly not, no, normally an engineer is not in a, a position to do that. This is why, you know, it's good to work with an mathematician. Okay, that's my summary. And in the last six minutes, I'm going to try and maybe get you enthusiastic about spray cooling. This is sort of my main topic. So, and um, so I think spray cooling is everywhere and um, you've probably seen it before. And this is the thank you slide. <laughs> And, and also the promotion side. So these are the people who worked, and these are the people who gave money. And that's a book we wrote a few years ago that uh, talks about some of these things. And basically, if you have to cool, let's say, a supercomputer, or now in the meantime, even small computer, it's not enough uh, just to have a fan. It doesn't work. The, the, the smaller things get, hmm, the higher the power density and uh, more cooling you need. And so, uh, of course, the idea is to go to the latent heat uh, vaporization, phase change, cooling. So you, you shoot droplets at it, they vaporize, and you've got this tremendous latent heat of vaporization at your disposal for cooling. And uh, so spray cooling in terms of heat transfer coefficient is great. You know, we're up to now 200 watts per square meter centimeter. And, um, and up to now, most of this has been done on a trial area. You know, shoot a spray and hope that Okay, but this is used in chip cooling, cooling of tools. This is forging, hot forging, or quenching in uh, rolled steel mills. You cool, and this depend. This then determines uh, the, the features and and, uh, uh, and characteristics of your steel, your milled steel, rolled milled steel. Okay, and so if you want to look at that, uh, then um, you know you you put a spray onto a surface. You measure the heat flux from the surface. You measure the spray in terms of size, velocity, and number density of the droplets, and then you say, okay, this spray cooled that well. But if you measure locally, 
then you know ah, the spray is not always the same locally, and also the cooling of the surface is not locally everywhere the same. So you have to start doing this more carefully, and which we did, and this is the way we do it. So what you do is, now I'm not too sure, I might have to start that film. Uh, this, this thing is, that's the only one I don't really get working properly. Somebody, maybe it will work, maybe it won't work, I don't know. Yeah, it's working. Okay, so you know you have this idiomatic, so well insulated uh, a block, and you turn on a heater and you heat that thing up to some temperature. I don't know, 600 degrees, and then you say, okay, that's a hot piece of metal, and now I'm going to take my spray and spray onto it, and and then I'm going to watch it starts cooling down. That's the temperature. Now it starts cooling down, and it's cooling down more on the side because it's a hollow cone spray. There's more spray on the outside than in the middle. And, and um, then you can look and see with a high-speed um, uh, high camera with a long-distance microscope, you could look at what's happening on the surface. And, and, and then you can see what happens. So the surface starts to cool down. So we start at high uh, temperature, starts to cool down, and then suddenly it pulls down. So this is the, this is the heat flux, not watts per square meter. And it cools down really fast here, so this is the critical heat flux. And then it doesn't cool down so fast. So this is time is going like this. And you can see it goes through several different cooling phases. There's different mechanics there. It's completely different. And I'll show you the different mechanics. So you know, this is the temperature and time. This is now time. This is the temperature and time. It's cooling down. And this is the heat flux in time. And, and now I'll just explain why we have these different regions, you know, these completely different heat flux regions. So the first region is just, you know, if it's not too hot, yeah, it's, I don't know, 80 degrees, so the water just goes down and then it splats, and then you just get some convective cooling, the thing starts to evaporate because it's hotter than the surrounding normal evaporation. Okay, so that's what we call natural convection. Then we have nucleate boiling. So the heat, now we have the, the surface is hotter than the boiling point, so you get little bubbles, uh, and, and, and you get some latent heat. Uh, so this is rather efficient, because you're using the latent heat of vaporization. And uh, this is that, uh, rather high, and then you get you know, transition boiling, where somewhere in between the thing is so hot, sometimes it's jumping off the surface. And this is maybe not so good, <laughs> because when it jumps off the surface, you don't get any heat removal. And this thing is a little bit more vigorous. And then you get what everybody knows at home. You go onto your stove, it's really hot, the water drop, it goes down, and it's like on an ice rink, and it's not even on the surface. And that's what we call film boiling. It's above the line frost point. And I'm only going to talk about that because it's a little bit of mathematics, and then I will definitely finish in five minutes. And um, and so uh, the others, of course, you can also do, and it's also equally interesting. But let's talk about the Leiden frost situation. And let's say, okay, basically this droplet is small, one millimeter, but the gap is maybe 10 microns. So basically it's infinite. It's a two dimension, it's actually a one dimensional problem. So let's treat it as a mathematician as a one dimensional problem. And now we have the heat that's coming out of the surface goes into the vapor layer, and that goes into the droplet, and the droplet absorbs it as sensible heat. It heats up, and it gets warmer. And so uh, we've got a fairly a one-dimensional uh, ordinary differential, <laughs> differential equation. All you have to do is do the boundary conditions correctly. So this is a little bit of analytical mathematics now we're talking about. So, you know, you have a, a contact temperature, so we look, you know, you have continuity, and you basically say the heat flux out of one into the heat flux in the vapor layer and the heat flux into the liquid layer, and this is the sensible heat uh, that is, you know, as the vapor layer gets larger, then uh, you've got uh, heat in the vapor layer, so the H, the H, the H D T, it's a larger volume or smaller volume, depending on what happens. Okay, so uh, so basically we can do some experiments and find out that actually the, the contact uh, the contact time, which is time for full evaporation, the contact time uh, is that is not a function of you know uh, how uh, um, fast the droplet uh, um, hit the surface. 
And if we non-dimensionalize with the drop impact velocity and uh, size, then in fact everything is one one line. And so uh, basically, we understand the hydro hydrodynamics. This is very clear. What we want to now look at the thermodynamics. And um, so you know you have it's you've got boundary layers, and you, the boundary layers are diffusion processes. And diffusion process goes as the square root of something times t, and uh, whether it be uh, heat energy. So energy, or uh, in, as a momentum, you have the something is then viscosity, or a species, and the something is the fusion coefficient. So you've got this square root of something times t, and we've got, of course, uh, in this case, our thermal boundary layers, which is the uh, thermal um, conductivity. Yeah, just like English. Okay. So, and then we have the the, the boundary conditions we know. Uh, this is the contact temperature, and at this at this interface, we must have the saturation temperature. That's the temperature at which it, it, it evaporates. No? So we know this. So we know the boundary conditions, and we can do in the solid substrate at the surface. And this theta is just you know where you are, and um, and so we we it's just a one dimensional heat transfer problem. This is really uh, engineering uh, thermodynamics 101, and and then you've got the same thing. Oh, sorry. You've got the same thing in the film, and then uh, you know you've got your heat balance equation, and um, yeah, I, I, I just don't need any further comments. You've got these three ordinary differential equations, and you put them in MATLAB and you solve them, and then you get an interesting thing is you get, uh, an, uh, and then you have to know what is the surface. Yeah? If it if it splats out, I have to integrate over the whole, whole surface and get the total heat for one droplet. And we know that from hydrodynamics, how much big the splat is. We know that. And that depends on the impact velocity and size of droplet. And, and um, so you know the radius as a function of time, and you have to go up to some time, and you get the heat removed for a single droplet. Huh? Very simple. And then you can say, OK, this is the solution. And everything in there is well known. We've just made some symbols, except for tsi, which is uh, a constant we have to find for one of them because there's some end effects and whatnot. It's basically one. And, um, and then you have to say, OK, that's one droplet. And if I had 1,000 droplets, how much heat would? Well, first you could say, well, if all of them are independent of one another, superposition, just add them up. Now comes the mathematics again. What is the probability that two droplets are hitting close enough together that they interact with one another in space and time? Poisson statistics. <laughs> you just say, okay, what is the probability of two or more not doing that? And then you get the probability of one. And so it's a simple Poisson statistics. So you say, why don't we just do superposition? And in this film boiling regime, that's great because the things just bounce off and they don't interact with one another. So you can, you can, I was a skip. And, and so this is just an animation, you know, okay, how many droplets impact when? And the thing is, you can have a tremendously high number density, a tremendously num uh, large kilograms per second per square meter fluid coming out, and there'll be no interaction. You can treat this as a problem of superposition. And even if you don't, and so you see there's no interaction, even at very high loadings. And, and, and even you can look here. This is the effective wetted surface area. If it's one, there's no interaction. And if it's less than one, there's some interaction. And I mean, this is for like 20 kilograms per square meter per second. This is more than you would find in a steel mill for quenching steel, for hot rolled steel. I mean, it's huge. And, and, or in forging, hot forging. And so, I mean, it's basically one. And then, of course, you can go, and now this is my last, basically my last message. Basically, you can say, take a look. These are now measurements taken from different people. Uh, these ones were taken with little droplets, 18 microns, at 27 meters per second hitting the surface. And these were 350 microns with 14 meters per second. And those are the data and the lines are our theory. I mean, these are people, who saw, one was in Hanover and the other was in Bremen or someplace. I mean, we can predict this, which is, of course, with a little mathematics, really little mathematics, actually. That's my summary. I don't repeat it. And this is my main message for today. And I thank you tremendously for your attention. I see everybody is awake. This is tremendously enheartening. <laughs> thank you very much.
understood there could be questions. Yes. That's why I brought my wife. She will answer the questions. So <laughs> 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 I just speak up loudly. On this I really only understood biofuel mechanics, but what was the question exactly? MRV is applicable only for blood flow related. Uh, MRV. Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. This is. Um, I mean, obviously, you have the spatial resolution problem, and as you increase the uh, B field, uh, you can get better resolution. So, in biofuel mechanics, typically your length scales are small. I, let's just assume, and and so what you need is uh, a small. I mean, what I was showing you was whole body MRIs, and these are you know big machines and seven Tesla is already a lot, but you know you there are MRIs. I think if if chemists are here, then you would call them NMRs, nuclear magnetic resonance, or physicists are here. You would call them NMRs. It's basically the same thing. You've got and these things could go off now. They're up. I don't know, I, I'm just guessing 20 Tesla or something. And, but then your, your volume is, you know, a cubic centimeter. And then, of course, you can start looking at things like um, the diffusion processes in porous media, so typical biomedical type questions. Uh, but, then, but then, of course, your system is small. And, and uh, I was talking about more engineering systems, you know, like, uh, for instance, um, uh, um, these channel flows, uh, aneurysm uh, models, you know. And sometimes we increase the size and decrease the velocity and keep the Reynolds number constant. It's because then, of course, you get you can get better spatial resolution. Right? It's clear. Uh, a little bit louder. Sorry. Radiant magnetic field. So in MRVs. Yeah. So how how you get the magnetic field? Yes, I have no right. idea. <laughs> but, no, actually, you, you use coils. I mean, you you uh, there's huge coils, and you put electricity through, and Maxwell equations tells you the E field, the B field, is somehow a time of the E field, and I mean electricity. <laughs> there must be some electrical engineers here that can explain that. But I tell you, I tell you some funny stories because I was I was uh, taking a train ride home from a review panel with uh, two people who were basically the pioneers of this whole thing. And they were they were making their own coils. I mean, now Siemens or Toshiba or General Electric make this. In. But they were really winding their own coils. And, and you know, and <laughs> he was from Heidelberg. And he was saying, you know, we had made these things and, 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 and you know, we were experimenting. It was clear that we could do something with this stuff. We're talking about 90s, the 90s. and, and but we left it on one day and nobody told the cleaning lady and she came in with the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> okay, I mean, there were funny periods at that time when things were just started. Uh, but I, to be honest, I have no idea. I mean, I yeah, I, this is not my field. We just use them. But as I say, you can buy them. And, and I named the three companies and for the NMRs, and uh, let's say not the physicist MRIs, but the chemists and whatnot, uh, chemical technology. These, actually one of the largest companies uh, that, and worldwide that build these is just um, the neighbor to where I did my PhD in Karlsruhe, Brugger. Brugger makes these things, and I think you probably have a dozen of them here at ISC. Uh, Brugger NMRs, they're everywhere. Uh, maybe some more questions? Okay. I realize everybody wants to go to high tea, so <laughs> that's fine. Uh, okay, good. Fine. How do you create it? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, basically, what you're doing is tomography, and and. Let me say the following. Um, it's difficult in a large volume like our bodies, it's difficult to create a homogeneous aligned B field because there are end effects 
and you know, I mean, I think you've taken electromagnetics, you know, and you, you get some concentration of E or B, B lines. But that's the trick, is you try and get this homogeneous B field, and that's what these companies are, of course, working on all the time. But you never achieve it, so you get some distortion. And the distortion, then, you try to correct in the data processing afterwards. So you put in ground truths, and then you see, okay, what comes out of the ground truth? And then you say, okay, that's distortion, or you might call it, if you're an optics person, aberrations. And, and it's some sort of an aberration. And, and you correct for that aberration post-dictive. So when you get your data, you try to correct for it. And, 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 and so then um, what you're doing, so tomography is a, is a concept for you. You know, you typically you have a, a, a transmitter and a receiver. And then you have another transmitter and another receiver, and another transmitter and another receiver. And you get all of these different receivers. They do this even in the ocean over like thousands of kilometers, you know, to get ocean currents. And, 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 uh, and, and of course, if you have a, a receiver here and a transmitter, you have to know you're receiving that signal and not the signal from the neighbor. But okay, this is solved. And, and what they do is, of course, they rotate. That's what makes so much noise. Uh, they have several going rotating at the same time. And so, and when you do that, you typically you use what's called like an inverse back projection. It's an inverse problem. And, and you use a back projection, it's in Fourier space. And, and from these signals, you then reconstruct in space where everything came from. And we're reconstructing in case space phase and amplitude. But I mean, exactly how you do this, don't ask me. I, I mean, tomography is, uh, I think other people can answer that question better. But maybe it gives you an idea of what's involved. Uh, so for the SVM experiment, what is the total number of data points that you collected? Uh, on which experiment, sorry? SVM experiment. SV and the support so vector machine. Um, yeah, I think. You know that those variances, the, the error bounds that I was showing, I think there were something like 200, but it's not 200 droplets. <laughs> I will tell you why. Because in the acoustic levitator, these droplets are in there, but um, they don't, they're not stationary, they rotate. And they rotate for two, two reasons. One, you know, uh, there's a, an inner and an outer acoustic streaming, what we call. So there's a little bit of a flow there. And, you know, somebody opens the door and that all is enough. So what you do is you take 200 pictures of the same droplet with different orientations. And the scatter, so you know exactly the volume because it's the same droplet, but there's scatter and that's the air bounds I showed you. No? And, and the acoustic streaming is, I don't know if... Um, Schlichting, so uh, did this in 1954, and it's in his book Boundary Layer Theory. But you won't find it unless you're looking for it. And the reason he did it was something completely different. He said, "What happens if I have a cylinder in a flow, and the cylinder goes back and forth, so an unsteady oscillating cylinder? What would the boundary layer look like in this oscillating system?" And he solved the problem. And of course, now if you think about it, that's exactly what's in an acoustic levitator. Now the cylinder, the sphere is stationary, but the, the acoustic field is going back and forth. It's exactly the same problem. He did the cylinder, um, now, now the, somebody and a Russian name did the sphere. And in the 90s, we did the deformed sphere, so under gravity. So that's why in the ISS you have, of course, a lot of acoustic levitators because you have no gravity, and then you have perfect spheres, and, it's, and you can make big droplets. <laughs> but um, in, in, on Earth, we have slightly oblate spheres because of gravity, and, and the, this Russian fellow didn't solve that. We solved that problem. So we know exactly the acoustic streaming that uh, gets, uh, um, and you have outer acoustic streaming depending on the far field boundary conditions. You know, if it's in a, in a little tube or in a big room, then you get different outer acoustic stream. And this rotates the, and, and moves the droplet. Yeah. But then, yeah, I should actually explain that in a lecture now. Yeah. Okay. Good question. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I paid him 200 each. <laughs> okay. Uh, on behalf of SA,
We thank Professor Cameron for the talk. That's all appreciate. And uh, our professor is present with Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Another thing Thank you. Okay. This is something from my yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we'll have a photograph. Please be seated like that. Please be seated like you can please have your seat. Ah, and you can take from somewhere here. Instead okay, of sure. uh, every one of us going there in front of the department, it would be nice to have a photograph here. I hope that'll be all right. Please have this. Ah, I see. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Your... <laughs> Yeah, you please come. You can also please chat. Oh, yeah. I think we're trying to see you. Great. Great. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So we have the high key, the hard key adjacent. Please join. And final announcement for those who are interested in taking part in this CM activities, please get in touch with us. We'll join. Of course, we'll tell you about the membership and all those things. I hope most of you are IAC students or someone from outside. Yeah. I think there are a lot of offers for.